All right, everyone. Well, this is uh, James Wilson with MTB Strength Training Systems, and welcome to another Bike James podcast. And I have a special guest today. I have Coach Rodney King with uh, the School of Crazy Monkey Self Defense. Coach, how's it going? Doing good, James. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. And I know you said to call you Rodney, but the problem is, is you're my coach. So it's just a I habit of mine to, uh, uh, to, to call people that. So um, you know, I, I recently have uh, completed the, uh, the, the training part and still have to, to you know, turn in my homework and get that completed. But I've recently finished a, an edged weapon self-defense course uh, that you had uh, put on. And so during the course of that, I was really impressed with the, uh, some of the things that you were talking about, both just from a real world self-defense standpoint and also your experience with uh, the neurology and, and physical effects of these things. And so I wanted to get you on and share some of these things with uh, with my listeners. So appreciate your uh, your your time. And so before we get into it, though, uh, I want to hear your backstory. How did how did you get to become a, uh, a quote unquote real world self-defense expert? Well, you know, James, that's the problem, right? That story is probably going to be a, an entire podcast in of itself. So I'll, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Um, I'm originally from South Africa, although presently I, re- I live on the Isle of Man, which is an island just off the coast of the United Kingdom. It's in the Irish Sea. Uh, I was brought up in government housing, so similar to the projects in the United States. So naturally, in those kinds of environments, violence is everywhere. You know, the gangs that I had to avoid, the bullies at school. So from an early age, kind of my mindset, my focus was on survival. And that really kind of set the tone for the rest of my life insofar as wanting, A, to know how to defend myself. And then later on, as an adult, that moved into teaching other people. And I've been doing that pretty much since I was, I don't know, 16, 15 years old. I've been teaching. I started teaching like little kids and, you know, in karate. And I'm still doing it to this day. And I'm close to hitting the 50 mark. (laughs) All right. Wow. Well, that's, uh, um, yeah, a good little snapshot of that. So I think the important thing to take from that is that you, you have experience with real violence this isn't uh you know a lot of the stuff that you come at this from isn't from a theoretical standpoint um and so the uh th- that's what I, I i like about that um so what was the origin of crazy monkey uh, I, I i personally i came across you it was uh cecil birch i think i was listening to uh a, an interview with him and then i was uh researching more about him and i saw that he uh, was talking about your stuff. And, and so I started digging into you and, uh, so yeah, the, the, the crazy monkey, like I, I like the, um, I like that, but I want to know what, it, what was the origin of that? If you can explain just kind of the idea behind that to people. I think the, the most important part of my kind of young, um, young adult years, like my early twenties, I, mean, I came out of the military, not being the, at that time in the South African defense force, being part of the military was compulsory. So you had to go to compulsory military service. I served in the close protection or VIP protection wing of the military police of the South African defense force. So I was quote unquote a bodyguard. Um, And so I came out of that, not having the skills to be able to find a normal job. I was also kicked out of the house when I was 17 by an abusive alcoholic mother. I found myself sleeping on the inner city streets of Johannesburg. So all of that kind of culminated into this situation I found myself in where I couldn't actually find any work. And I ended up working the door as a bouncer for several years outside some of Johannesburg's most notorious, roughest nightclubs. Um, In the beginning, I was just a bouncer. By the time I'd left, I was running several of the clubs, the security for the clubs, and had, had over 70 doormen working for me. And it was really that experience that became the catalyst for what we know today as the Crazy Monkey Defense Program, at least from the self-preservation standpoint. And so it was those experiences and actually being immersed in interpersonal violence, literally on a, on a nightly basis, that kind of just really solidified for me what actually works in interpersonal violence and what doesn't. Now, I already had a background coming out of violence, but it's a completely different ball game when you find yourself in a quote unquote career position where your job is to deal with violence, right? And so, you know, and that, that, that experience taught me what it's like to deal with one person, with multiple attackers, 
with or without weapons and so on. And so that really became the driving force for the Crazy Monkey Defense Program. Now, if you want the, how the name came about, that's a different story. Yeah, where did the name come from? I mean, it really just started as a joke and it's kind of annoying, really. I mean, I didn't have a name for it. It was just stuff that I was putting together through my experience. And as I was, like I said, working the door and, and teaching and just kind of starting to develop my own ideas, I had all these ideas, all these things we were teaching, but we didn't have a name. And one of my friends went on a safari and he was out in the African bush and he happened to see two troops of monkeys get into an altercation. So one troop was trying to invade the other troops uh, territory. And what he noticed was, is that some of the monkeys in trying to protect themselves did something that is the hallmark of my program, which is how we defend, which is by picking our hands up and protecting the operating system and it's a un unique way of doing that. And he saw the monkeys doing that too, right? So we could talk about the evolutionary aspect of that and how people always pick their hands up to try to protect their face and the operating system. Anyway, long story short, he came back to the academy after his safari. He was standing around with all the guys and he was talking about these crazy monkeys that he saw on his, on his trip. And everybody was standing there going, oh, that's what we should call it because we didn't have a name, right? So yeah. oh, we should call it the crazy monkey. And I'm like, that is the dumbest name ever. And I, I was against it in the beginning. I was like, I don't want to call what, you know, what we do crazy monkey. That's just a stupid name. But over time, you know, it just kind of set in. And, you know, when people were talking to their friends or, you know, girlfriends or boyfriends and they were going to come train, well, I'm going to go train crazy monkey. And before I knew it, the name stuck and I couldn't get rid of it. So it's still around today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's definitely uh, an attention getter. <laughs> yeah, I think some people don't understand, right? Like for some people, they they kind of think, you know, that, it's it is different. And it's. Uh, yeah, yeah, we yeah, seem I to be yeah, hold on, hold on, let's just back up for a second. We seem to like, have, like, for both of us froze there for a second. Let's start oh, okay. again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was uh, um, just saying how from, uh, you know, from a, a marketing standpoint, it definitely stands out and is, uh, but like you're saying, it can be confusing. People can have a, you know, get the wrong interpretation of it, I guess, is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I think like most people who don't know any better, like automatically think it's some kind of like Kung Fu style, some monkey Kung Fu style, which it isn't right. I mean, it's, and you know, at the end of the day, uh, jokes aside, and I say it's, it's kind of like a, a goofy name that stuck, but in some respect, I like it because it doesn't have that kind of hardcore edge, skull and bones kind of thing that you always see in the quote unquote reality based self defense world. And I, to be honest, I can't stand that. I just, it just annoys me. So I'm actually maybe, you know, in hindsight, actually happy that we chose a name that doesn't kind of uh, portray that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is. Uh, um... Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. It's it's interesting because like my own, uh, you know, backstory, I guess, like I've kind of started getting into this more like, you know, tactical. I, I like the word preparedness better because tactical brings to mind like, you know, dudes in cosplay, you know, and dressed up like soldiers and stuff like that. And that's like, that's not exactly what people who are into this for the right reasons are into it for. And so, but you do see a lot of that when you get into the, the real world self-defense, you see one of two things. You see a lot of uh, McDojo BS that is just nonsense. And then you see a lot of this like really hardcore, you know, you know, street fighter uh, mentality that is, uh, is tough for the average person to approach and, and feel comfortable with. So that's what I liked about your, uh, your approach there. So it's interesting that you say that, right? It's something that I always have to kind of bring to the forefront because not a lot of people talk about it. You know, you were saying those two examples, you got kind of this like really, you know, stuff out there that just is never going to work. And then you got the, you know, but they put it under the tactical brand or you have this kind of extreme perverted expression of reality-based self-defense. And in actual fact, both of them are most of the time equally inefficient. And part of the problem is, is that, you know, anything can work within the confines of a defined environment, right? So, for example, if I'm standing there and I tell somebody to attack me with a specific attack, I already know what it's going to be. They, they execute their attack, like they say, they throw a punch, they hold it out there. I can pretty much do whatever I want to do and I'm going to look pretty good, right? I'm going to look Jason Bourne. The problem is, though, it, the reality of interpersonal violence is nothing like that. It's chaotic, it's unpredictable. 
and it never goes to plan, right? So you have to be adaptable all the time. That's just the reality. And the fact of the matter is nobody's just going to stand there nicely for you and stick their arm out after they've punched and then let you go do whatever you want to do. People fight back, funny enough. And so the biggest problem I see is that a lot of stuff that's put under this kind of banner of reality-based self-defense actually is nothing like reality. It's the furthest thing from reality. It looks good for a movie, but that's about pretty... Actually, a lot of times, funny enough, when you watch movies, or at least when I watch them, I think some of the fight scenes are better. You know, so it's... <laughs> You know, again, it, it, in, in principle, it seems okay, but I mean, we could talk about that. But the biggest issue is it's not so much necessarily the techniques per se, but it's rather the pedagogical approach. It's how they teach um, and not taking into to context what the reality is actually going to be, right? It's like, it's, it's one thing learning the theory of something, but it's completely different when you put something into practice, right? I mean, you, you know, you were talking about mountain biking. So imagine, for example, I explain to you what it is to ride the bike, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, and so forth, right? And say, okay, fine, you, you know how to ride the bike. You know, that's not true, right? You know, you've got to get on the bike, you've got to go for a ride, you've got to go on the terrain, you're going to have to fall off, you're going to have to, you know, learn through hard knocks, what actually works, what doesn't work, and hopefully you come out on the other side with some experience, and so that stops happening to you, right? But in the world of uh, reality-based self-defense, nobody ever has to prove really that they can actually do it. They can set up a nice, neat scenario that looks really good on paper, so to speak, on, on a video where everything's pre-planned um, and predefined. And people look at that and they go, wow, that looks amazing. Because you know, for most people actually, who go to these places, these modern martial arts experiences like reality-based self-defense, they often are in the Western world they often in the places of the world that don't have a lot of violence. So people don't have a real context for what it is to be in violence. They think they know what it is, but they don't, right? I mean, reading it in the paper or watching it on TV is not the same as actually being there. So unfortunately, most people don't know what it's like to be in the, the fray of interpersonal violence, what it actually is, that experience. And because they don't know, and you have a lot of people that can sell you anything, you know, so they can basically just sell you lies and you wouldn't know any better. I mean, people fall for stuff all the time, right? From like the new health thing on the block, you know, take this and this is going to help you. And just because it looks good on paper doesn't necessarily mean it actually is in reality. Oh yeah. Well, the mountain biking industry makes a, a, a living on that literally by convincing people that uh, this new theoretical bike part or whatever is going to make all the difference. And, and it's uh, like you said, at the end of the day, it's experience with it i i think um the the term i like to use with with stuff like that is like pressure testing your your technique and that's one of the things like i also have a, a background in jujitsu i've been doing jujitsu for a little over eight years and it's funny because it's it's a it's a it's a plus and a minus right because i think in some ways jujitsu gets a little too arrogant with its ability like you know the fact that you can pressure test it that's what separates i think jujitsu from other martial arts is the fact that you're able to actually pressure test it. You slap hands, you bump fists and you go at it. And so, whereas like, you know, I did kind of a Taekwondo type martial art when I was in high school. And I remember always thinking like, man, is this really going to work? You know, cause if, if this guy here is not following the same rules that I am, is this really going to work? And so you run into that, that lack of, uh, of being able to pressure test what it is that you're training and see, does this really work? And so that idea of, of pressure testing it, that's where, um, again, where it's easy to kind of fall for this McDojo stuff, you know, again, is the, is the where this made up stuff like you're referring to, because without any ability to really pressure test it, like you're saying, like, how do you pressure test your, your knife fighting abilities or your knife defense? Like, you don't want to get into a knife fight, right? So there's ways to do it. You know, there are, I, I've seen people that have, you know, the, the suits that you can dress up in and, you know, I mean, you can you can pressure test some of these things, but that, that side of it is so small in the, in the martial arts world that it's really easy for people to believe their own BS. You know, like a lot of these guys who are doing these disarms, like I, I think they truly believe that this stuff will work, but it's, uh, I, I think one of the other things I really liked about your, your course is at the very beginning, you were so um, adamant about making sure that everybody understood this is a primer right? You're not teaching expert defense skills and you need to take your responsibility 
seriously that this could save somebody's life. So don't oversell what you're offering. Don't, you know, like do make sure that you appreciate that responsibility. And, you know, again, I think that, uh, it, uh, that that's not, not everybody emphasizes that or really understands that on, uh, on some level. Cause if you really did, then you'd understand the need to pressure test it. Like if I'm going to tell somebody to do this, like I need to have pressure tested this in some way and make sure that it actually works, not in some set scenario. So, um, so yeah, no, that's a, um, I think a big part of that. So I guess, do you have what you would kind of a, a philosophy of self-defense? Like, do, is this something that you uh, have, have thought about and kind of put, you know, uh, into words, like what your core philosophy when it comes to self-defense is? Yeah, I mean, I think I do have a have a philosophy on self-defense. I mean, it depends on on how we are defining that, right? I think the first thing is one of the things I always try to make clear is we need to make a distinction between what I would call self-preservation and ego defense, because they're not the same thing. And I think people right. get that confused, right? So for example, if I'm all about self-preservation, preserving the self, then the way that I approach a situation that could potentially become something that could you know, harm me will be completely different than if I approach it from ego defense. So if I'm walking in a, in a, a bar somewhere and somebody knocks into me and I've got some drinks in my hand and the drinks go flying all over the place and my first reaction is to get pissed off and angry and to get in the other person's face and then that person you know, flips me off and I won't let it go and I take you know, that next step and I get physical, that's my ego. That's not self-preservation, right? It, it, if it was self-preservation, I would always take into consideration that you never have any knowledge, forehand knowledge of where this thing can go. And things can get out of hand really, really quickly. So when we're thinking self-preservation, it's exactly that, is that I'm trying to preserve myself, which means that the ultimate victory really is, is not to get into an altercation in the first place. You know, going back maybe a little bit, we take a couple of steps back. It starts with everything I do. It's like, how, how do I show up in the world? Do I show up in the world where I put myself in a place that, I, that I'm, it's easier for me to become a victim? Or do I put myself in the world in such a place that it's much harder for somebody to target me? So if I'm on my phone all the time and I'm distracted, especially when I go to places that I don't know, I'm going to be more of a target than if I wasn't on the phone, right? Um, am I situationally aware? Am I looking at my environment? Am I taking note of what potentially looks like a problem? Am I trusting my spidey sense? Or am, I, am I trusting my intuition? All of these things are the aspects of self-preservation, right? But at the same time, people get so fixated on this whole self-defense thing, but they don't watch their diet, right? And probably what's going to kill them before some mugger on the street corner is their cholesterol, so my diet is part of self-preservation. When I get in my motor vehicle and I put my seatbelt on, that's part of self-preservation, right? Because it's about preserving the self. It's not about defending the ego. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people don't make that distinction. And so when you see a lot of the stuff that is taught, oftentimes what is always taught is, you know, the, the hammer and the nail, right? So if, if, all you, if all you ever have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. So everything is is going to be dealt with with a physical response whenever there's a quote-unquote potential for interpersonal violence to take place the way that you sort this out is with a physical response that to me tells me that whoever is teaching that doesn't understand self-preservation right it's what are the things i could have done that will put me in a position so i don't ever have to go physical with somebody now of course you know there are situations where there is no way out of that right but even then, when I go physical with someone, my thinking process is to eliminate the threat and then move myself away from the threat to a position of safety, not to stick around and now continue the, the, the altercation or try to run up and kick the person or whatever you see oftentimes that's put out there. You know, once I feel that I've neutralized this person long enough to get myself out of there, I should be moving. That's self-preservation, right? But I can see why that doesn't seem glamorous right it's not hollywood and for a lot of guys they have a real problem with that right because guys got this this whole this ego thing always in these kinds of interpersonal things where they want to kind of you know puff their chest out and they want to be like peacocks and they want to you know they want to prove what a badass they are and walking away from a fight doesn't sound so so gangster 
So, yeah. you know, so that's the thing. But if you're being really honest and it's self-preservation, then that shouldn't matter because I want to just, I want to get home safe. I want to get back to my life. I don't want to lose my life over something that I could have quite easily have walked away from or used verbal jujitsu. I could have de-escalated it just with the way that I'm talking to this person. So those to, to me is, is the important, what, what oftentimes is referred to as the soft skills, but actually they are the hard skills in an indirect way because they take a lot of maturity. They take a lot of uh, uh, foresight and they take practice where, to be honest, it's much easier just to hit somebody. Yeah. That's not the hard part. Well, dealing with what might happen after that is uh, the hard part that a lot of people don't um, have. And again, that's something that you that you see in with, with doing jujitsu is people have such a, a, a weird, a distorted sense of their own abilities to handle themselves in a fight. And, and they walk around thinking they're Jason Bourne because, you know, they've watched all the movies and not realizing like, no, you know, you're, that's not how it's going to work, you know, when, when it really uh, goes down. So that, that detecting and avoiding violence, again, that was something that I really uh, liked about your approach. And you spent some, some time giving people like pre, you know, what are some cues that people are, are about to get violent? So I think, you know, obviously the, uh, um, the, the awareness part, like just, you know, keep not being on your phone, just kind of trust in your spidey sense, you know, that's a big part of it. But then also too, when you do come across someone, like there are some signs that like, Hey, this is, this is going from just a, a heated conversation to potential violence. And I think I, I, I did, I mentioned to you, before we started the podcast, there was an incident a month or two ago where there was a, a mountain biker who was stabbed by a hiker during an altercation on the trail. And, you know, it was uh, the, I'm sure that there were signs that this was going south before it went south. And, and the rider, unfortunately, just kept pushing it. Like the, there was a, a group of hikers coming down and he was coming up and neither one would yield the right of way to the other. And the rider ends up like trying to push the issue and riding into the group. And he ended up like falling over on, on one of the guys because he was clipped in. He couldn't get off his bike. He falls over and the guy thinks this guy's riding into him and attacking him. And so he pulls out a knife and starts stabbing him. And it's like, man, this whole situation was just ridiculous. But like you're saying, people don't, they're, they're not aware. And they're also not aware of some of these cues. So what are what are some of like the, the, the common cues uh, that people can see like, oh, wait a minute, this person's really starting to get irritated. And I, I really need to maybe change course on how I'm handling the situation. Yeah, I think it's hard to like, kind of just outline like what the cues might be, right? Because it's going to be determined on the situation. Let's try to use the situation you just described. Now, obviously, yeah. both of us, we weren't there. I don't know the whole story. I'm obviously going Same based here. on your description. So that's kind of what I'm using. Okay, but it sounds to me that both sides wouldn't give, give way that's where the, the argument started, right? So now let's say I'm the person on the bike. How would that have changed my life if I just decided that I was just gonna just step off the trail for a second? Why does that even matter? Why is it such a big deal that I can't do that? You know, if I just stepped off that trail for a split second, let the people walk, cause I could see that they weren't gonna give way. I could, you can see that they have been aggressive and argumentative and oftentimes of course I'm, I'm assuming there were more than one person when there's more than one person people feel more brave than when they're on their own you're just a lone biker so just step off the trail and, and let them go and had he done that where, where would we be now on the story so was that really self-preservation or was that ego defense yeah yeah you see so that's the thing right I mean, in my mind, that's ego defense because there was probably an opportunity there to have stepped off the trail and the whole thing to have just gone away and you, the guy would have carried on riding his bike and everything would have been as normal and he'd be spending time with his family as he always has. This is the thing that people have a real hard time with. So even if that person on the bike was able to read cues, supposedly, or had the, the knowledge or the training, I could make the argument that he probably wouldn't have done it anyway because he was in red mist. He wasn't thinking clearly. He wasn't being rational. He was being emotional. He was being ego defensive. So no amount of even knowing that information is even going to help him, right? So another yeah. part of, of, and this is one of my pet peeves in this reality-based self-defense world is that 
they're always pushing the aggression. They're always pushing the killer instinct. It's kind of this whole thing about like get mad, get pissed off, you know, be red, you know, get in there and, you know, literally do whatever you need to do to win, which is fair enough. But at the end of the day, is that really where you want to be? There's an assumption that I need to be there in order to protect myself. And I can tell you that I can be in a perfect, calm, centered, focused state and still do what I need to do and win a fight. I don't need to be in that place. Uh, one place that you learn that for sure is jujitsu, right? So you also learn in jujitsu that if you get pissed off and angry and mad, the person that's more calm oftentimes kicks your ass anyway. Why is that? Because they're not in red mist. They're not running on emotions. They're clear. Their prefrontal cortex, the front of their brain that makes appropriate decisions, is able to make those decisions, right? They're not locked into their emotional kind of brain, which is hard then to make proper decisions. So mm. that's my point is that point. I much rather be in a calm, focused and centered space, do what I need to do if I have to protect myself, but that's the place that I want to drive from. Now, I guess the problem there is that in of itself, the ability to be able to do that outside of training properly for it takes enormous amount of flight time, internal flight time. Like I said earlier, most people are using physical responses to deal with interpersonal violence and spending little or no amount of time on the internal mechanisms that are required. And that's the hard part. It's also very hard to package that. It's also very hard to sell it. It's one of the things I always say is that real, if we can call it self-defense, real self-defense doesn't sell, right? So you were talking about, you know, you, you just did the edged weapons course with me. I spent the first part of that course really talking about responsibility, about what your role is, what you're actually teaching people, and just basically grounding you so you don't think that you're Jason Bourne, and that's not what you're doing for people, right? Well, vast majority of people that want to teach don't want to hear me say that. They don't want to hear that conversation, right, which is unfortunate, right? So um, another edge defense program that tells people everything they want to hear, plus all the gruesome blood gore stuff. We probably had, had over a hundred people sign up for. Mine's not going to. And I realize that, right? Because when we start talking about real interpersonal violence, there's nothing romantic about the, the, the experience. It, it's not like the movies. You know, most of the time, right even in the midst of this, you're thinking, why the fuck am I here? Why am I even in this? I don't want to even be a part of this. I don't even want to be here. You're regretting the fact that you're even there. You know, and that's, and that's just the reality. Nobody wants to be in violence. It's not our natural state, unless you're a psychopath, right? To want to get into altercations with people. You'd much rather move away from it. And so if you have the right skill set and you know that you can do it, then you've got those physical skill sets if it's required. But actually being in a much more calmer, focused, centered space is actually much better for you because then you're going to make appropriate choices and decisions. If that guy on the bike didn't get so angry and pissed off about something that's really insignificant at the end of the day, in, in, the, in, the, in the big picture of things that could go wrong in the world, how big deal is that? Getting off the, off the path. Really, it's nothing. Who cares, right? It would have taken, what, less than 60 seconds of his, of his life. Instead, he wouldn't let it go. And then there was the ultimate consequence. He paid the ultimate price. Yeah. Yeah, no, those are, are really good points. It's, uh, it's funny. Like One of my favorite books of all times is Musashi's Book of Five Rings. I've read it a bunch of times. And in there, he talks about like, you know, you're going to have to come back to the same attitude after a fight. So why change attitudes in the first place? Like, you, you know, you, you don't need a, a fighting attitude and then a normal attitude, you know? So like you're, you're, you, you should approach everything with the same calmness and, and, uh, and, and focus there. And, and, uh, yeah. And I like your point too, about how, even if he was able to, you know, if he had the skills to be like, Oh, he's looking around, he's clenching his fist, you know, he's doing some of these things that you mentioned might, might be indicators that someone's about to get violent. He's not going to notice that because he's already pissed off because he's arguing with the with the guy it's it's uh it's like in jujitsu when you ask coach hey how do i get out of this submission and they're like dude you fucked up like five steps ago you know that's, that's how you get out of that submission is you recognize what's going on five steps ago and so uh yeah no those are are uh, are really good points i think this um, yeah there's also two things there so on musashi as you will know if you've read the book so many times 
um, one of the ways that he beat his opponents is how he beat them mentally. Well, like oh, pitching, yeah. up, pitching up late for a, for a match, an hour and a half late, kind of like look like he just woken up. He's got his sword over his shoulder. The other guy's like, man, I've been here for like the last hour and a half. It's disrespectful. You got offense, right? Yep. You know, and uh, who do you think you are? And I've been warming up and everything. And yeah, you come like you've just, you know, just woken up two seconds ago. No, Musashi did that on purpose because he knew you were going to get pissed off and angry. And then, he's, then you're easy to beat. So he yeah. knew that too, right? Second to that is, I mean, I have a story I've, I've mentioned it a couple of times in other places, but I was in uh, Malaysia a few years ago. I happened to be out one night and I was in a, a, a part of the town that we thought was okay. And I was standing at the, at the lights to cross the road. And I noticed this guy, he was on his uh, mobile phone and he was walking across this, the other side of the road and he was coming really, really quick towards me. But I was talking to my friend too. So I was kind of in between talking to my friend and noticing that this guy was coming across the road. Long story short, he bumps into me. Not a big deal. It happens all the time, right? So I just turned to him and I said it politely. And I said, hey, man, just watch where you're going. I, I wasn't like angry. I didn't swear at him. It's like, hey, man, watch where you're going. And I even had like a, a, a grin on my face. I wasn't, I wasn't upset. I was actually in a really good mood. And uh, he turned to me and he said, what the fuck did you say to me? And so already you can see, right? So now I have a choice in that moment in time. How am I going to respond to that? Well, the way that I responded to it is I immediately picked my hands up because I need to always put a barrier between myself and a potential threat. I can see this guy's suddenly aggressive for something that he shouldn't be aggressive for. So he's probably out looking for trouble that night, looking for a reason to get into a situation. Or he's just maybe just angry and pissed off before with his girlfriend. Who knows, right? But he's pissed for something that he shouldn't be angry about. So I pick my hands up and I start making space. The space is really important. If there's available space, you should always use it. Because, you know, if you allow somebody to get too close to you, then it's harder to respond. So space is your friend. So I made some space and picked my hands up so that if he does come towards me, he's got to get past my hands. And when I say pick my hands up, I'm not saying making closed fists, right? Closed fists is the universal sign for fight. Once you go with your hands closed, there's no talking. There's no verbal jujitsu. Hands open, just talking, hands up talking to the guy, right? What I call the bear position. He kept moving towards me. I kept moving slightly back. As I'm moving slightly back, rather than backing up in a straight line, I'm kind of zigzagging a little bit. I'm making you know, motions to go 45 degrees. The reason I'm doing that is because I'm going to have all the physiological changes just like he is, right? My adrenaline is going to start kicking in. It's going to affect the way that I'm able to see. I'm going to lose peripheral vision. So if I just back up in a straight line, all I'm ever going to see is what's in front of me. So if I can move a little bit off to the sides, I open up my peripheral vision. I'm also looking to see what's around me because up until five seconds ago, I wasn't thinking I was going to get into an altercation, right? So what's around me now? Where are the cars? Is there an equalizer? Should I need one? You know, because I don't know what this guy has on him, right? And while I'm talking to him and while I'm doing all of this, he reaches into his front pocket and he pulls out, which was at that moment in time and was throughout the whole experience anyway, was a blade, but it was a folding blade. So basically it wasn't out, right? But it was one of those ones that have like a, um, a knuckle duster on it. Mm. Yeah, so he pulled that out. And so he's got this blade, you know, he's put his hand on it. He's got it in the knuckle duster position, but the blade is there also. And I go, so what are you going to do with that? And he goes, just in case. That was his response to me. So the whole time now, I'm thinking, okay, let me see how I can de-escalate the situation. I'm not thinking, how can I take this guy on? Or like often in these reality-based self-defense videos on YouTube, preemptive strike, preemptive strike, right? Preemptive strike, hitting that threat first is an assumption that I'm going to eliminate that threat. That's ridiculous, right? First of all, who's to say that that, that first thing, that, that first move I make is going to eliminate the threat in front of me? And what happens if I don't? Remember, he's got a blade. I got nothing on me other than my, you know, and I sure, I teach edge defense, but I'm not stupid either, right? I don't want to go hands-on with somebody with a blade. It was a pretty big blade too. So <laughs> that just doesn't make any sense, right? So I've got my hands, I'm talking to the guy, I'm looking at my surroundings, I'm making the space, the appropriate space, but I'm talking in such a way so that I'm de-escalating the situation. I'm using my verbal jujitsu. He takes that blade, he moves it from his hand to his back pocket, okay? So now, again, there'll be some guys out there be like, that would have been the time, that would have been the time to go in and, and eliminate it, right? I'm looking at him and I'm going, okay, first of all, this guy's in pretty good shape. I can see, you know, it's, it's Malaysia. Every, it's always over 30 degrees uh, Celsius. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but it's freaking hot and there's 100% humidity. So he's in really good shape. He's athletic. You know, that means it's going to be a tough day, right? 
And even if I threw the first shot, again, my, this is always the way that I think about things. I'm never arrogant and egotistical enough to think that I, because of how long I've been training, I can take out anybody that steps up to me. Because I've had enough experiences, especially when I work the door, where things go south, right? And so I could have gone in and I could have hit him, but what happens if it didn't work? What happens if I didn't immediately annihilate this threat in that moment? What do you think the next thing's going to happen? That blade's going to come out. And I might end up, maybe not even losing my life, right? But I might end up in two places. Either I end up having to kill this person, which I don't want to be in a prison in Malaysia, right? Because I'm telling you right now, I'm not going to get, get out of it and walk away, right? Because we don't have to get into the religious thing, but let's just say I'm not on the right side of the religious divide on that day, all right? So that's the first thing. The second to that is, let's say you know, he, he doesn't kill me, but he puts me in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. Is that worth it? No. And so I did everything I've been talking about and I walked away that day. And to me, that's a victory. And I never had to engage with him. And yet he has the reality, right? And I will never see that guy again. Yeah. I will never see him again. He's nobody in my life. Who cares? So what? And I went on with my, with my evening. I had a fantastic evening. And I'm still here to tell the story. So to me, that's what I mean by self-preservation, right? And so that's a completely different mindset. But how do you, I know I keep harping on this, but I, I, I know why these things go the way that they go. When you go to these uh, reality-based schools, they have all these hundreds of techniques and different belts that you can go through or whatever they've got. They just, it keeps going and going and going and going. Because what I'm saying is how do you sell that? How do you package that, right? That's a, that's like a, a one lesson discussion and all you've got to do is remember to do it in that moment in time, right? It's not like I can tell you to keep coming back every week to, to, to learn how to do that. It's, it's just something yeah. that you just need to know in that moment in time and apply. But again, the other part of it is the whole way through that is I'm also monitoring my own physiological response. So I know how to breathe in a highly stressful situation. So I'm watching my breathing. Um, and this is just automatic because that's something that I do train. We train that in jujitsu, as you know, right? I mean, the worst place that you can be in jujitsu is when you've run out of gas. Mm, when you're on the yeah. bottom and you run out of <laughs> gas and somebody's on top of you, and you've probably had this experience where you go, I'm just going to make that one move, that hard move. That I'm going to give it everything I've got, all my power to get out, and it doesn't work. And then you're totally fucked, right? And that's it, man. And then you're just dead in the water. There's no worse feeling than that. And over time, as you start developing your skill sets, you go, that's just a stupid thing. And actually being calm, focusing on my breathing, keeping safe is far better because I want to be able to ride the storm the way that I, I describe it, right? Yeah. And so that's basically a kind of, if, you know, that's my philosophy. I know it's not, it's not all like, you know, Hollywood and, you know, all the bells and whistles that often people put out there, but I think it's pragmatic. And I think when, I think again, you know, I'm, I'm coming from a background where I have been in sustained violence ever since i was a kid all the way through into you know my my 20s and, and so on and plus i've taught for a long time and, I, and and as you know i've trained so many different groups of people from the everyday person to airline cabin crew to special force military operators law enforcement teams close protection groups i've been around people who have, are real world warriors that put this into play every single year they're somewhere in the world in some bad place and they have to go hands-on right and so when you've kind of immersed yourself in that and you really ground yourself you there's no reason to have this kind of ego aspect to it because really you, you want to do what you need to do to to carry on living and that's that should be the most important thing yeah no that's the super good points uh I, one more point on that and then i want to actually kind of segue into touching on some of the things you've talked about already which is the, the physical reaction and neurology of fear, but uh, when I'm uh, coaching self-defense, especially in the kids' class, I, I ask them a little trick question. I'm like, "Hey, what's the point of a fight?" And you know, oh, to beat them up or blah 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 blah. And I'm like, "No, no, no. The point of the fight is to not lose the fight. That's the point of the fight, right? Like maybe you have to stick around and fight to the end and quote unquote win, right? Maybe that's what you have to do. But your goal is to not lose the fight. So, can you lose a fight that you weren't in? No. So every fight you walk away from you've accomplished your goal, but it's like you're saying, like you have to, to change how people look at what is your goal, right? If your goal is to not lose the fight, all of a sudden walking away from the fight 
meets that goal. But if you're, if your goal is to win or not let anybody, you know, uh, push you around or, or whatever that is, um, then all of a sudden you start looking at everything. Like you're saying, like if, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail and uh, you lose those, those other skills. Yeah. And that's probably like a much deeper conversation, maybe not for this time around, but for sure, not everybody, of course, not everybody, but a lot of people that go into these schools to learn how to protect themselves are not really there to learn how to protect themselves, right? What's really pl placed them there is they have deep insecurities about themselves. They have skeletons in the closet. They don't have confidence, low self-esteem. They don't, they, they don't feel like they can meet the challenges of the world. Maybe they feel insignificant, whatever the thing is, right? And so they've gone into the, the martial experience in hopes that that's gonna help them overcome those things. Now, it can if coached correctly. Unfortunately, if you end up going to some of these kind of perverted, really screwed up reality-based self-defense places, it's all on the violence and, and, and you know basically meeting violence with violence, what you end up doing is you start creating problems for this person way beyond what they came in with. So rather than allowing them to overcome those inner obstacles and those inner demons, you basically bolster them. You make them more, you know, pronounced. They 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 come out in in really bad ways, and you know you cannot have any experience in life without it altering you. So if you're going into an environment where, in essence, what they're teaching you is to become more violent, you will become more violent. My goal always is to teach people how to become less violent. Now that's not to say that historically in my life that I wasn't violent because I went down what I call the red road, right? Of, of kind of the intoxication of the warrior energy. And I went down the road that was the wrong road because I didn't have good mentors to show me another way. And I luckily came out the other side and figured out that wasn't gonna get me what I wanted. But that takes an enormous amount of maturity. And that's one of the things why I harp on all the time. When you look at the way that I teach is I always talk about Nat Street and life. And at the end of the day, of course, I want to be ready to protect myself. Of course, you know, I want to have the experience on the mat that enables me to at least pressure test everything like you noted earlier. But how do the lessons from the mat show up in my life in a positive way? How does it make me a better person? Martial arts should make you less aggressive, not more aggressive. It should make mm. you more calm. It should, should make you more stressed. It should make you less paranoid, not more paranoid. But when you go onto YouTube and people can do that and type in reality-based self-defense, watch how these guys talk that are teaching and then ask yourself, would you like to invite them over to dinner with your family? I don't think you'd want to. I don't yeah. think you'd want to. So that to me tells me that there's a whole dynamic going on here below the surface that never gets discussed. You know, it's yeah. interesting too. Like if you look at people who get themselves into trouble, it's always the same people getting themselves into trouble. And then when you see how they behave and how they act in life, then you go, oh, I can see why this guy always gets himself into trouble. It's yeah. not a coincidence, right? And now put him in a place where it's teaching him how to use his physicality. And now he's always getting into trouble. It becomes a menace to society. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, the psychological layers, it's funny, everything, uh, you strip down one or two layers, and you're going to find some psychological thing going on. And unfortunately, so many people just aren't even aware of these things swirling underneath the surface, and, and they're being controlled by forces that they just don't even know are there, but they're, they're, they're very much controlling them. But um, yeah, like you said, that's a, that's a whole podcast in itself, getting into the psychology side. So uh, to kind of um, bring it to the mountain biking thing to, to wrap it up, I know I uh, had you on here for almost an hour, so I don't want to take up too much of your time here. But uh, um, so the neurology of interpersonal violence, that, like I said, that was I, I like that term. I like big words that make me sound smart so I can throw that one out when I'm talking about it. Um, but could, could you explain a little bit uh, about that? Like what happens physically to you when you are confronted with uh, interpersonal violence? Well, I mean, I'll keep it really simple, right? There are, there are a few things that come out that are very evident. Uh, one of those is we have something within our, within our human machinery called the autonomic nervous system. The word auto kind of describes it. It's automatic. It's outside of your conscious awareness. 
I'm going to very simplify it, like I said, right? So if there's anybody from the medical fraternity listening to this, please forgive me. I am just simplifying it so people can get it. But there's two components that we need to take note of here. One is the, what's called the sympathetic nervous system, and the other one is the parasympathetic nervous system. So if people have ever heard the fight and flight and um, you know, freeze response as an example, that all is driven from the sympathetic nervous system. So the minute I'm engaging with what looks like a potential problem, like a potential threat, and this also happens in stress, right? But we're talking about violence. So let's keep it within that, right? My sympathetic nervous system is going to engage and it's going to do a whole lot of things that's going to get me ready to be able to engage with this potential threat, like moving the blood flow away from my extremities to the middle of my body. My stomach is going to stop working through breaking down food. It's going to stop doing that. It's going to conserve energy and just basically get me ready and primed to deal with this threat that's in front of me. My focus gets very centralized. I lose peripheral vision. Um, Oftentimes people talk about auditory exclusion. You don't really um, hear things so much around you because everything just kind of just gets totally centralized in what's in front of you. You, you feel you know, your, hands, your hands get clammy, your knees start knocking together, the butterflies in the stomach, the dry mouth. These are all indicators that your body is getting ready and priming itself to deal with this potential problem in front of you. Now, we need that, right? It's not a bad thing because you want to have that because it's increasing your energy capacity to deal with this, this problem. The issue really is when it, it overshoots itself, when it gets way too high to the point where you're no longer able to actually do what you need to do. So, you know, you see this a lot of times people have trained for something, whatever it may be, then they put in that situation and then they freeze. And the reason they're freezing is because their sympathetic nervous system is running so hot that in a way to try to keep itself protected, it just starts just shutting itself down. It goes into a freeze situation. You'll see animals do that too, right? Is that if, if it sees a predator, if it feels like it can't run, it'll just freeze. It'll just stand still hoping that it doesn't get seen. So these are just some of the physiological changes that are taking place. That's what's going to, we need, like I said, the energy, but at the same time, it also affects our motor programs. So what happens is anything that you want to engage with your body that's going to be fine motor coordination or even complex motor skills is going to be very difficult to do because in that moment in time, your body is only activating movement patterns that it thinks is going to be the best for survival. So those things will be like pushing, jumping, pulling, running, right? Think whatever. Back in the day, hunter-gatherer walking in the savannah, suddenly faced by a lion right? Whoever can run the fastest and get to that tree, climb up the tree is going to survive, right? And so that would be your, your initial reaction. So these are all the things that are, that are happening. And the, 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 the question really is, do you have the training to balance that out? Because you want it. It's not like you don't want it. It's not like all those changes are things that you don't want to have. You want them because that's going to enable you to actually get into the situation and actually deal with it and bring everything to bear, all your energy but you also don't want way too much of it so that it starts degrading your performance. So that's where you need the parasympathetic nervous system to kick in, which is your calming system. You need to have that so you can balance it out. And there's different ways to do that. Uh, one way I mentioned right in the beginning was breathing. Breathing is a big thing, right? Um, also, how do I manage what is happening within my consciousness and my cognitive structures, the way that I'm thinking? Because your thinking can affect your performance too, right? And so if you start, you have all these physiological changes and then you're second guessing yourself, that becomes a problem in when you want to make that necessary move. And right? when you actually have to make the move to doing something, you might be unable to do that because you've been second guessing yourself, right? And so that kind of almost puts in a roadblock in your ability to perform. And I think anybody listening to this, they can kind of think about that also from mountain biking or any sport for that matter, right? It's like when you're in a situation and you start overthinking it, along with the physiological changes, that's where you can get yourself into trouble. And that's oftentimes where people end up either A, injuring themselves, or they do freeze, so they can't make their next move. I mean, just even this morning, funny enough, um, I was out in, on the, like I said, I live on the Isle of Man, and there's an area called the Chasms, um, it's quite steep cliffs going down to the, the, the beach area. And we were climbing there. So going down, no, no big deal, coming up. 
there were some hard spots coming up, right? There were certain parts there where I was like, oh shit, man, you know, my head's going, I don't think I can do this. I don't know if I can make it. Like I'm worried because if I slip there, I'm going far. I'm going to, I'm, you know, they're going to have to call in medivac, right? And so in that moment in time, I'm switching myself over to my breathing, focusing on my breathing, getting my focus to shift to my breathing. So I'm not focusing on my thinking mind and what my thinking is because my thinking is telling me that I can't do it, right? And so I have to be more present and be more mindful. And when I'm actually able to stay there, then, you know, sure, the physiological changes, I felt all the changes, right? I could feel the, the adrenaline start pumping, the butterflies, the nervousness, all those things coming in. But because I'm focusing on my breathing and that's where I'm staying, I'm not kind of getting hooked into my thinking process. And so there's, there's a good example. So I, I want that, 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 that energy, like I said, because otherwise I won't be able to make that climb I need that energy, but also I have to be able to manage it so that it doesn't become my enemy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think there's a, uh, yeah, a lot of good uh, points there. Like you're saying that, that mindset that it's going to take to be successful in a self-defense situation is the same mindset that it's going to take to be successful when you're faced with, you know, maybe falling off a cliff or, you know, being faced with a, a really sketchy section of trail that you're not really sure that you can, you can do. And so, um, but also to your, your point about how, as these physiological changes happen, which one that happened to everyone, right? I think a lot of people almost feel ashamed because they feel fear. They feel these emotions, you know, we all have this vision of the, you know, the, the stoic guy, who just, uh, or, you know, gal or whatever, who doesn't feel fear. Um, and so they, they feel it, it's okay to feel it. It's more a matter of how do you, you handle it? But one of the, the things that's going to happen that is, you know, physiologically is you're going to lose the ability to do complex motor skills. And, and one of the things that I see in the in mountain bike skills coaching is you'll see these coaches who are giving people like, you know, the 10 steps of cornering, you know, the it, it's like, man, when you're in a sketchy corner, you're not going to be able to try and execute. You think about these things and execute these fine motor skills. So, you know, one of the things that you do with your self-defense uh, program is what are simple gross motor skills that we can take advantage of uh, because that's what you're really going to have access to in these situations. And I, I think the same thing happens on the bike as well. Like if, if people were, were looking at, you know, basic movement patterns and, and gross motor skills that they're being applied to these instead of these, you know, cause you can break things down to the infinite thing. And, and then, it makes you sound smart when you're the coach who is able to break these things down to all these minute details, but then the athlete can't apply it. It's no good. And so, um, so yeah, a lot of really good uh, info there as far as, you know, the, how, how people can deal better with um, these inevitable changes that are going to happen. But like you said, breathing and training can help you uh, overcome those things. So. Um, yeah, and, the, and yeah. The, place that, the place that you work that, right, is you, you choose some places where maybe it puts you a little bit on the edge, like you feel those physiological changes, right, but not, to, not an experience to the point where if you did screw up, it's going to be a, a, a bad thing, right, like a, right. Oh, yes. to recover, and use that as your, your learning opportunity. So in that moment, are you able to just stay with your breath, right, not get hooked into your thinking patterns where you've you know, you've got the second guessing going on because that's the part that, that creates the problem is, is, as you know, to like when we talk about these physiological changes, all of us have, are going to have these physiological changes. It's, it's, it's built within us as human beings, right? The difference is, is the interpretation. It's how we interpret what we're feeling is going to be different from one person to the next. My kind of way that I've always approached it is a lot of times when you're in a performance environment where you actually have to perform, it's quite hard to change the interpretation in that moment in time. So if I'm thinking negatively, it's very difficult to push that back into what we could call a more positive frame in that moment in time. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is you need to short circuit that and place something else in there that moves you away from it and almost in a neutral place. And again, I keep saying this, but for me, what's been very, very successful is a focus on breath, mm -hmm. specifically focusing on the out breath. Now, the reason why that's important for a couple of things is that when you're focusing on your out breath and you're breathing, you know, breathing in and breathing out, but really focusing on that out breath, that engages the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the opposite to the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is there to calm you down, right? It brings you back to 
homeostasis. So breathing out enables you to engage that part of your system because this, these systems are happening, you know, automatic, right? You don't have conscious control over it. So if you've ever been anxious and you've told yourself to calm down, it, any, anybody can agree it doesn't work very well, right? And actually by telling yourself to calm down, you make yourself more anxious because the reason you're making yourself more anxious by telling yourself to calm down is because there must be a reason you're telling yourself to calm down. So it becomes a feedback loop, right? So your brain gets on this kind of hamster wheel. What's a better approach is to go for breathing because it's neutral. One, if you focus on the out breath, like I said, it's kicking in the parasympathetic nervous system. But when you are staying with the breath, you are steadying the mind, which then steadies your body and it brings you back to a more present state. Now that takes practice and you need to practice it in situations where you have the potential to mess up. There is some kind of small consequence. So it's kind of like pressure testing, right? But not so much that you can't come back and get on the bike again, right? Just right. enough to kind of give you a wake up and you keep going back and you're rehearsing it and saying, well, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm concerned. I don't think I can do this. Okay, this is the time for me to get back to my breath, stay with the breath, stay with the breath and do what you need to do. That's always been amazing to me too, right? Is that we don't see the body as a natural intelligence the way that it should be. It's almost like the body is a workhorse. It's, just a, it's, it's something that gets our brain from point A to point B. Actually, if you get out of your own way, the body can do amazing things. I'm always surprised what the body can actually do. You don't need to keep telling it what to do. So by staying with your breath, it's, it's you allowing the body actually to make the decisions for you, which actually is going to make better and clearer decisions. A lot of times in a highly stressful situation, when you are trying to cognitively work through something, because of where our, our thoughts go and often into the negative, it trips us up. It's not positive. It's not beneficial to us, right? So... Uh, the breath thing, I think, is, is, is a huge thing because it basically brings you back more to the present moment is what you're really looking for. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. That's actually uh, been a really big, um, I mean, I've always been kind of into, into breathing as a, as a coach and trainer. But over the last year, I've really taken a, a much deeper dive into it. I've uh, you know, been doing the Wim Hof method uh, mm. super uh, regularly for the last year. I did the uh, oxygen advantage uh certification i did the xpt um breathe breath work certification and so uh yeah breathing trying to to bring riders in their more awareness of how their breathing can affect their performance um it, you know I'm, I'm really glad you're talking about that because it's it's totally reinforcing a lot of things that i've been uh trying to talk about applying on and the that's bike also, yeah and within that is is idea of mindfulness too and i know it's kind of a buzzword I spent several years studying mindfulness for my doctorate. So that's kind of where I was for, for quite some time as a researcher. But mindfulness is also this capacity to be in the present moment with whatever is arising both inside and, and externally without judgment. And so again, it's the, the judgment factor. It's when we create a narrative, a story, it's the story we hook into the way that we're feeling that becomes our biggest obstacle and our problem, right? So if we're able to find a way to unhook ourselves from that story, not to say that we, we don't recognize that it's there, we know that it's there, but without continuing to give that narrative power, we really are in a place where we can perform at a much higher level. And so there, there's so much to be said about this. Coming back to just Musashi, where we talked about earlier, the Book of Five Rings, right? That's the number one thing he did each time is he got these guys that he went up against that he challenged, he got them out of the present moment. He got them to be pissed off and angry, right? And by doing that, he wasn't there and he knew that that would put him in a victorious position, which it did, all right? So even in the, the, I can't remember which one, but there's one story in there where the guy that he goes up against is supposedly somebody that has a huge uh, and, and very well-known mental game. Like he's supposed to be one of the best swordsmen in Japan and never gets upset, never gets angry, is always calm, focused and centered. And Musashi finds a way to get him out of that, right? And when he does that, that's how Musashi wins. So is that the one, is that the one where he carved the sword out of the ore on the yeah, way over that's the, the island? One. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. One. yeah. Yeah. Yep. He was a master at uh, at that mental game with it. And um, but yeah, you know, reading his 
his work and just understanding his own under, you know, like I said, like, just, you know, don't walk differently than you d would normally. Like just, his whole thing was like, if you're a warrior, you're a warrior 24 seven, like this idea of a distinction between like your warrior self and your out and your everyday self is, uh, isn't right now. I would say the same thing with mountain biking. If you're a mountain biker, you're a mountain biker 24 seven, like the food you put in your mouth this morning should be influenced by, I'm a mountain biker. How is this going to affect my training? How is this going to affect my recovery, your sleep, what you put into your, your brain, like all of these things affect all of the, everything that you do. So it's, uh, yeah, that mindfulness, like you said, it is a bit of a buzzword these days, but it is, uh, if, if you're going to be successful at anything, you, you really have to learn how to cultivate that, but it's not something our society really encourages. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's the thing, right? I mean, I, I'm assuming for a lot of people riding the bike and it's the, it's the way that they think about the experience as they're having it that trips them up. Right. And so if they can find a way to be more present in that experience without judgment and they have the ride of their life, so to speak, right. They find their groove. They're able to do things they never thought possible just because they, you know, ultimately they've got out their own way and they don't have this narrative around it then that's going to shift over just like when I talk about in martial arts, right? That's going to shift over into their everyday life. And suddenly what they're going to find is that when life throws curveballs at them, when there's a roadblock, it doesn't, you know, knock them off their, their wheels, so to speak, right? It doesn't take them out. They're able to make the, the, the corner that they need to make. They're able to circumvent the, the roadblock that's in front of them in a way that is more calm, more focused, more centered, right? And with poise that's all going to come from that experience. And I think that's also really important. I think with anything that we do is not to just do something for the sake of doing it because it's a hobby or whatever is to say, how does this play out in every aspect of my life? Because I think that's where it becomes usually positive for people, right? It's like when I go out and, and walk in nature, am I just going for a walk because I know I've got to exercise or am I going there because I'm really fully there in in nature with the with the experience and taking the fullness of that experience in it's two different intentions right one is just to walk and one is a life-changing experience right so you could say the same thing about writing you can say the same thing about martial arts and if you approach it that way then, then that's a beautiful experience because then it, it really does fundamentally change how you show up in the world yeah no totally it should be vehicles for self-discovery and self-improvement not chances to massage your ego. Yeah, and exactly. uh, yeah, that's uh, so anyways, awesome, man. Well, I, like I said, I know I've had you on for a bit here, so uh, we could probably just keep chatting along. Seems like we've got a lot of uh, uh, common uh, thoughts on, on, on training, whether it's uh, training for real world self-defense or um, mountain bikers or, or whatever that is. But, uh, um, but to, you know, wrap this up, if people, want to learn more. I know you've got your, your school of crazy monkey.com website and you have a really good, uh, free self-defense primer course, uh, that, that I took, uh, went through the videos, very informative, good, basic, uh, usable info. Um, so people can, can go and, and sign up for that for, for free, just to kind of start, um, their, their journey. If they're looking for somewhere to, to go, is, is there any other uh, places you want people to check out or any, anything else they should uh, keep in mind when, when looking into you more? I think that's definitely one place to go the school of crazy monkey.com. Um, alternatively to that, just, uh, Dr. Rodney King.com. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're doing a lot of, uh, of, uh, um, stuff beyond just the, uh, the martial arts, yep. uh, world as well. I know you've got the, uh, some, some different telegram groups, which I, I wasn't familiar with telegram before I got involved with you. So it must be more of a, of a, a UK, you know, EU thing, or maybe I'm just behind the times on, on where yeah, it's well, Telegram is kind of like the new WhatsApp, but it's better, you know, cause we can actually post videos on there without yeah. having to worry about file sizes and things like that. And the reason I did the telegram groups is because just for me personally, I'm, I'm trying to move away from other social media platforms mm. like Facebook, wherever I can. I just find like it's so negative there. And also you don't really get to build a community, right? And I think that's one of the things that I miss. I miss that, that community, that, that connection, you know, connecting with people, sharing ideas. And I, I, I'm trying Telegram and see if that's going to help a little bit. But even there, you know, it's quite hard to get people to actually talk. 
It Maybe is, people yeah. Have what it's what it is. It's they've forgotten how to communicate, right? But hey, I'm trying. I'm trying, and so I'd always rather do it in person. And so that's the other thing that I do is um, I, I live the other part of the year when there's no COVID. I live in Thailand at uh, a Tree Roots Retreat, which is about two hours drive from from Bangkok. It's right by the coast um, in Rayong. It's a small, sleepy fishing village, and we've got a retreat down there. And I do a lot of retreats down there too. The Embodied Warrior Treat, Retreat is one of the things that I do where I integrate all these ideas we've been talking about, martial arts, movement, ecology, um, and just really a, a personal mastery experience. But to, for me, that's my favorite time, right? To actually just be with people and just explore the fullness of what we can be through all the things we've been talking about. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, all good points. So yeah, I totally agree. Any, anything we can do to move away from uh, the social media platforms is probably a positive thing. But um, well, cool. Awesome. I, I really appreciate your time. Um, you know, if uh, I guess people can can contact you through the, the school of crazy monkey.com website, if they have any questions or anything like that. So definitely encourage people to, to check out uh, Coach Rodney King and, and uh, his, his stuff. So um, excellent. Any other words of wisdom before we uh, sign off on the podcast here? No, cool. James, thanks for having me. And if people thought it was worthwhile, I'm, I'm always happy to come back. Excellent. Yeah, I, I may uh, hit you up on that. I, don't, I, I, I do these mainly just for selfish reasons. I love getting uh, people like you on here to, to be able to pick your brain. So I'm sure uh, I'll be, uh, be in touch here. So um, excellent. Well, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap this up. So again, everybody, you can uh, check me out at bikejames.com. And uh, I will talk to everybody next time.